Well, good afternoon, Mr. Minister, but I don't see you. Well, I, I hope you are here. I can see you and hear you. Well, thank you very much. It is a good start. So, uh, first, I would like to thank you very much for being... Ah, I see you now. I see you. I thank you very much for being with us. With us, it means the World Policy Conference, and it means uh, IFRI, uh, uh, which you know well. So, thank you uh, very much. As you can imagine, uh, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine has been one of the major topics that we have discussed uh, since uh, yesterday morning and that we will continue to discuss uh, until tomorrow late. Uh, many countries are represented here, not only European or the US, but also Asia and the global south. So uh, my first question, would be to ask you your assessment of the military situation just now as we are speaking. And uh, what, uh, again, from the military viewpoint, what, is, uh, what are your prospects uh, for the winter time that uh, everybody uh, for, uh, is discussing uh, with, of course, a number of uncertainties? So please, can you answer this first question? Dear Thierry, Dear participants of the panel, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would like to congratulate you on organizing this excellent World Policy Conference, which brings together so many prominent voices from all parts of the world. And this is the, the, probably the most important uh, achievement, to bring together representatives of so many regions and countries. Uh, you know, one important reason why Ukraine has not only withstood Russia's full-scale attack, but is actually gradually winning this war, is that we have never relied on weather, on this season of the year. Be it uh, winter, spring, summer, autumn, we keep fighting, because we are defending our land. And stakes are very high for us and nothing can stop us nothing can stop our brave Ukrainian soldiers and uh, our brave people of Ukraine who suffer enormously from Russian miss regular missile attacks on critical infrastructure depriving us of electricity water and heating uh, we know that our army needs to be well equipped to fight in the winter just as well as it fights in the summer and uh, uh, you need artillery ammunition always, irrespective of the weather or the season. And the difference between us and the Russians during the winter, there is one. Uh, we, of course, take better care of the soldiers fighting at the front line. We provide them with winter uniform, with everything that can help them uh, to warm up and to survive, uh, to survive under in this in this fight. Um, for the Russian attitude towards its own soldiers is different. For them, the lives of people uh, is not uh, are not important. We take many of them prisoners of war and see how they are how poorly they are equipped and uh, uh, what they wear. This is a disgrace, but it is this is the choice of the Russian army. It's not well equipped for winter. And I'm afraid that many Russian soldiers will suffer enormously from uh, uh, cold weather and will be seriously, <coughs> will seriously uh, be wounded because of that. So the hope that winter is a game changer and that Russians now like to talk about, um, uh, to talk about winter special time uh, represents uh, the mood in the Kremlin right now. We have the impression that Putin simply does not accept the reality that he is losing the war. From what we know, even a part of Russian oligarchs and military command realizes that Russia will not win this war. And the longer it refuses to accept the reality, the more painful the defeat will be. But Putin is not in that circle. He still hopes for some kind of miracle to turn the tide of the war in his, and the tide of history, I would even say, in his favor. 
Sorry for this comparison. I know they have been used too often in the past, but this reality reminds me Adolf Hitler in 1944 and 1945. He was hoping that Roosevelt, Roosevelt's death is a turning point after which he will be winning again, or hoping that there will be a Wunderwaffe, a wonderful weapon that will change it all and bring luck and victory back to Germany. The reality, in fact, is that Russia is losing and Ukraine is winning. Yes, the battles are very difficult. Yes, there are some difficult days ahead for us. Yes, we are paying a painful price, but we are fighting a just war against an invader, against an aggressor who was not provoked, who decided to go to wage war against us. We are defending our territory, and we are ready to pay the price, as any other nation in the world is. The most difficult situation is in Bakhmut. In Bakhmut right now, Ukrainian soldiers are repelling waves of Russian attacks 24 hours a day and literally seven days a week. Russia is waging their an inhuman World War II style warfare. They send forward poorly equipped and undertrained retros. Some of them are from the private military company Wagner and were recruited to this company from prisoners. Prisons, they are prisoners who were promised amnesty if they go in the first line of attackers in Ukraine and survive. These are not some kind of made-up stories that Ukraine is telling. This is the reality we see on the ground every day. Our soldiers intercept Russian military communication on that side. And you know what they call this poor cannon fodder, which they sent in hundreds to be killed within minutes? They call them one time it. This is the type of cynical and inhuman war they wage, where human life doesn't matter. And this is the this is the difference. This is the um, the biggest difference between Russia and Ukraine. The way we consider human life. For us, it's precious. For them, the people are one timers. You send them him into the battle, and uh, he gets killed. This is it. So, despite all the difficulties, we will keep moving forward. We don't care about weather. Uh, whatever weather there will be, we will keep moving forward until we fully restore our territorial integrity within internationally recognized borders. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very precise uh, answer. So, uh, now I would like to ask you about the notion of uh, winning the war, or losing the war, because there is one winning side and one losing side. Uh, how do you define precisely uh, winning the war? Uh, is it uh, total, unconditional capitulation, like, uh, let's say, the Germans, not in 1945, but in uh, 1918? Is it the way you would define uh, uh, winning the war, or the Russians losing the war? Uh, is it uh, the collapse of uh, the Russian Federation, of uh, Putin uh, committing uh, suicide, since you mentioned uh, uh, Hitler in 1945? How, how do you define the winning and the losing side? Well, frankly, I don't care how Putin ends, it's uh, uh, up to the people of Russia to decide. Uh, I care for Ukraine, and we are not asking for anything more than belongs to us by history and by law. And that is our borders. So for us, winning the war is fully restoring territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, which in practice means going back to the status quo that existed, that had existed before February 2014, when Russia began its war against Ukraine by illegally annexing Crimea. So this is, this is the, the non-negotiable part of the victory. This is something that must happen unconditionally. 
And then there is a broader uh, issue of the uh, strategic victory, not only of Ukraine, but also of the entire international community, because what is at stake in Ukraine relate, relates to all, to the entire world. You, well, the world cannot exist if countries can get away with violating international borders, committing, uh, committing mass atrocities, if these countries do not play by the rules. So the next question is how to make Russia play by the rules. And that is a more complicated question. Uh, because one thing is to kick them out of Ukraine, but the threat, the source of the threat will remain. I don't think there is an, a definite answer to this, to this question. There are many, many scenarios possible. But uh, a strategic victory for the entire international community will be having Russia that plays by the rules. And uh, this is something that we have to be focused on right now, on thinking how to make it happen. And if that requires a change of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, the regime in, in Russia, then uh, yes, Russian people have to, have, to, have to undergo this transition. But again, uh, I don't. I think this change should come from inside of Russia. It's the people of Russia who have to make a decision. The question is how to uh, create conditions where the people of Russia will realize that they have to make this change. And this is where international community can play a role. But again, without Russia, that does not pose a threat not only to its neighbors, but to the world order as such, victory, it's impossible to imagine a victory, a strategic victory. Well, thank you very much. That too is very uh, clear. Now I think that the Americans and the Europeans, for the time being at least, and probably for the foreseeable future, follow you in uh, the way you are uh, approaching uh, the, the crisis. But uh, the rest of the world, for the rest of the world, uh, as I told you, it is represented here also to uh, a large extent, do not necessarily follow you uh, entirely. Uh, for instance, uh, India, the, I am thinking of a recent uh, intervention of the foreign minister of uh, India, but others uh, say that uh, this war is not their war, it is not their cause. They consider it as an internal uh, Western uh, issue, and they see the immense uh, short, medium, and long-term consequences for them, if only economy, uh, food, uh, security, and so forth and so on. So what do you have to tell them since many of these uh, countries are represented here? Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, we all understand why people say certain things. You can say 100 times that this is not your war, but when uh, food prices go high, and when, because of the Russian blockade of Ukrainian uh, export of agricultural uh, products, all of a sudden people wake up and understand that they suffer from the war which they believe has nothing to do with them. And we hear uh, calls from many corners of the world asking to unblock the export of, uh, of, of, gra of grain from Ukraine. But the reason why it happened is, is simple. It's because Russia attacked Ukraine. It's not because Ukraine defends itself. It's because Russia attacked Ukraine. So some countries are playing a pretty hypocritical game by saying, ah, well, you know, this war has nothing to do with us, but uh, please uh, make sure that uh, uh, we receive our grain. And we don't want to judge. We don't want to call spade a spade. We don't care why this is happening. Just fix it. Just get it done. Others behave differently. They uh, try to benefit from the war. And so when some countries are saying, OK, this is a good opportunity to buy Russian oil at cheap price because Russia is making big discounts, yes, you, are, you have a right to do so because you care for your interests and for your people. But don't forget that 
you are making profits and you have the opportunity to help your people buy cheaper diesel at the station because someone in Ukraine is dying fighting the Russian army or dying from Russian missile attacks. Because without this war, without sanctions imposed on, uh, on Russia, Russia wouldn't be offering its oil with discount, trying to sell it globally. So everyone makes his point that makes total sense in the world politics. But uh, I think we deserve, you know, a friend, an honest, an honest assessment and appreciation of what we are doing. And if you are benefiting from this war, don't forget to do something to help Ukraine win, at least as a gesture of gratitude. Um, <clears throat> if you want problems caused by the Russian aggression against Ukraine to be resolved, don't forget to support Ukraine in, re in, in ending this war, because without it, there will be no problems. There will be no problems without Russia. I uh, can tell you that with absolute uh, certainty. I was visiting African, uh, some African countries, very good conversation, very conversations, very good friends. And one of my colleagues said to me, Dmitro, we only realized how Ukraine is important for our food security when the export from Ukraine was blocked. And now, for the first time in 30 years, we realize that we depend on you, on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I said, exactly, this is the point. You, didn't real, you hadn't realized it before because everything worked perfectly fine. And there was no reason for you to even think where this grain comes from because it was coming without any single problem. But Russia's attack changed it all. So those countries, those in the world who are saying that this is not their war, uh, should also remember one last argument, the one that I already mentioned. No country in the world wants a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, a nuclear power, to have the right to invade, to commit mass atrocities, because everyone else, if Russia succeeds with this, everyone else in the world who wants to change borders by force will be tempted to follow the pattern of Russian behavior. And people can say 100 times that this is not their war. But the truth is that the Russian aggression against Ukraine has global repercussions. And therefore, all of us should be interested in ending this war as soon as possible and ending it with the victory of Ukraine, because it defends not only itself, but also the rules that this world is based on. So thank you very much. And now we are moving toward a, to, towards a more uh, short-term issue precisely on how to help uh, Ukraine. I think next uh, Tuesday in Paris, the 13th of uh, December, there is a con starting a conference on the resilience and reconstruction in Ukraine. Uh, can you tell us uh, what uh, you expect uh, uh, precisely and what you need, uh, what uh, your demands will be? Well, we have to go through the winter, and uh, uh, the winter without uh, a stable functioning of the of our energy system. More than a half of our energy system was damaged or destroyed one way or another by uh, massive Russian missile attacks. Uh, the latest, uh, many transformers, many parts of the electricity grid, they are gone. They do not exist anymore. And our energy experts are making miracles uh, to keep uh, the country, country functioning. I myself spent uh, 30 hours uh, without the supply of electricity and water in the apartment where I live. So I now have this experience how to end up without light, heating, and water 
in the middle of the winter with minus five degrees Celsius outside of the window. So this is the biggest challenge now. Putin believes that he will break us down by destroying our energy system and uh, make us uh, freeze during the winter. This is a very silly uh, estimation and another mistake that Russia, uh, Russia is making. They're just wasting their missiles. Yes, they cause a lot of damage. Yes, people die because of that. But as a nation, we will not break down. So this conference that you mentioned uh, uh, it's, uh, in, in Paris next week, uh, first and foremost, we expect from it a, a coordinated effort of uh, those who will participate in this conference in providing Ukraine with um, transformers, generators, and spare parts for electricity grid that will help us to go through the winter. So thank you very much for this very concrete uh, answer too. Now uh, I would like to move to a wider uh, issue uh, until uh, I think it was in March of this year uh, that uh, President Zelensky uh, said uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine might consider to uh, a status of uh, neutralization, a neutral status. Of course, since then, you have uh, changed uh, your position and you expressed it uh, very well. But more precisely, my question is, uh, do you intend to apply uh, for NATO, the candidacy for NATO, uh, anytime soon? And if it, if it is not soon, when? Uh, actually, we did. We did apply. Uh, I think it was a, a month or two ago. Uh, we did send a formal, a formal application. I think, uh, you know, we just don't want to waste time. If this, one of the outcomes of this war will be full uh, integration of uh, Ukraine into the European Union. And, uh, and NATO, because uh, we have to think strategically. Yes, the country is at war now, and it's hard to imagine us uh, joining NATO right now. But the future of the Euro-Atlantic security is being decided on the battlefield in Ukraine. And after the war, Ukraine will have uh, one of the most capable armies in the world and definitely the most capable army uh, in Europe, taking into account its combat experience, uh, morale, and military, military equipment. So it would be very unwise uh, for NATO to ignore uh, or not to accommodate such a uh, contributor to the Euro-Atlantic security. And in a broader sense, of course, it's obvious that the eastern, eastern border of Ukraine Will, is already the eastern border of the um, Euro-Atlantic space. It's a de facto. It, it, you know, it's the statement of fact. So uh, membership in NATO it will be just a legal, a legal recognition uh, of it. This, this will come, I have no doubt in that. Of course, we will be hearing many discussions, many statements, pro and contra. Uh, this is all how the world works, we know how to live with it, we know how to work with it, but strategically I have no doubt that this is going to happen it's just a matter of time. Would you say, would you say that it is easier, so now I, I, I'm talking pr relatively practical things, I mean the uh, conditions uh, to uh, apply, to, uh, to be uh, accepted in NATO versus the condition to enter the European Union, which is a much more complicated stuff. So would, would you say, uh, from your viewpoint, that it is easier and it should come faster to become a member of NATO than to become a member of the EU? Procedurally, definitely. It is easier to become a member of uh, NATO than of EU. But uh, in both cases, uh, you know, this uh, accession uh, implies making a clear political decision by current members within a specific period of time. And uh, as I said, uh, the timeline is, 
I, I don't have a very specific answer about the time when, when it will happen, and I don't know what will happen sooner, NATO or EU, in terms of the timeline. But uh, uh, I have no doubt that this is going to happen. Um, if EU and NATO compete with each other in the pace of uh, bringing Ukraine in, I, I will only welcome that, uh, that competition. Yes, uh, well, we have uh, just a few minutes left, so uh, perhaps we could uh, concentrate on this time perspective, because you know, uh, one possible scenario, I don't know how, which probability you would assign to it, would be a short victory, really, meaning perhaps a clear victory, victory uh, in the next few months, sometime in 2023. That's one scenario, and uh, intellectually, it is likely that it, if, if this happened, uh, the issue of joining NATO and this uh, political uh, decision to accelerate uh, your admission to the European Union, all this could go relatively fast. But there is another scenario, which is uh, that of a protracted war. Uh, some, a war which could continue to last for months, for months, and some people uh, even say for years. And the, if this happened, uh, the whole history could be rather, rather different. So uh, could you uh, tell us your reasons to believe that you could achieve a victory in a short time span? Um, actually, you know, we are not setting any specific deadlines uh, for ourselves. Because, as I said, we are fighting a just war against an invader. And if someone breaks into your apartment and uh, you are trying to uh, fight him, uh, fight uh, him back, uh, you know, you're not setting yourself a deadline. You're not saying, okay, I will fight with, the, with this uh, intruder for 10 minutes, but if I don't succeed, then I just give up and allow him to do everything that he wants. Or I propose him that he stays in the corridor and I will keep the rest of my apartment under my control. Mm. This is simply not how it works when you are invaded. When you are fighting a just war against the aggressor. You fight until you kick him out whatever it takes, and it doesn't matter how much time it takes, because you're fighting on the right side of history for the right cause. So uh, there are different estimations based on uh, the military capacity, the economic capacity of both sides, the impact of sanctions, uh, the impact of uh, Russian revenues from trading oil and gas on the economic stability in Russia. There are many, many, many calculations and estimations, but I don't think none, of, either of them is, is, will be correct in the end. Because uh, there is also an element of the black swan that has to be taken into account. Not everything can be, uh, can be uh, forecasted mathematically. This is, this is not how war works. You know, what I learned in this, in this 10 months of the war is that war is a combination of mathematics and philosophy. The so both, on the one hand, both are the same. Yeah, on the one hand, I have, you have to calculate the resources, but on the other hand, it's really about perceptions, uh, morale, and understanding of the end purpose of your, of your effort. So uh, we are going to win. This is going to happen. This is already happening. And uh, um, time doesn't really matter. What matters is the availability of resources to win. The more resources we have, the sooner we will win. The less resources we have, the longer it will take. Last question, because we are approaching the end. I think we have agreed to respect exactly the uh, time uh, span. If instead of me, you were talking with Macron, what, just now, what would, you, what, would, what would you tell him? Suppose I, I am Macron. Say, Mr. 
Mr. President, thank you for being a very strong supporter of Ukraine and sending the weapons that you have already sent. Thank you for supporting, for playing a leading role in uh, uh, granting Ukraine, in building consensus to grant Ukraine new candidacy status. But this thing about security guarantees for Russia is something that uh, we don't think uh, makes a lot of sense to even raise. So are you as right to ask you that question? So I hope I gave you the, answer, the good answer. Well, uh, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for this uh, very open, uh, genuine uh, uh, answers that you made. Thank you very much, and I uh, hope that uh, in a not uh, too distant future, uh, with uh, an improved situation uh, on the front of this war, we will have the pleasure of discussing with you again. This is, uh, as you did it a few months ago at IFRI, so I invite you for a similar discussion in, within the IFRI framework uh, uh, at the end of the winter, so during the winter, at the end of the winter. Thank you very much and best wishes. Thank you, and my best regards and appreciation to all participants of this panel. Thank you. Thank you.